part will be tumors of the orbit, and the second part will be um, intraocular tumors, which basically is retinoblastoma. So we will start off by looking at the tumors of the orbit. Uh, so before we even go into any details, I don't know, have you already had the lecture with Dr. Nyenze? Yes, we have. Okay, so this is just maybe just a quick overview because I'm sure he must have uh, discussed this, how to evaluate a patient with orbital disease. So most patients with orbital disease will present with proptosis. The orbit. And the most important thing, uh, you need to take a good history especially regarding whether there is pain and also mode of onset of the proptosis, whether it was gradual or it was rapid, because this will guide you as to what you could most likely be dealing with. Then it is also important to conduct a general examination. In general examination, of course, you're looking for the vital signs, how the blood pressure is, you also check for lymphadenopathy. You will also check for things like pala because this could also guide you as to what could be the underlying cause of the proptosis. Uh, then you go to inspection. Even before you touch the patient, the first thing you do is look. And the most important thing is you want to note the direction of the proptosis because, sorry, because the direction of the proptosis the direction of the proptosis is always opposite where the lesion is. So for example, if the globe is displaced inferiorly, then it means that the lesion must be superior. If the globe is displaced inferonasally, it means that the lesion must be superotemporal. Then you go on and measure the proptosis and the most important thing you want to establish is the severity of the proptosis. Measurement is important because as you're treating the patient, the progression of the proptosis is what will guide you as to whether the patient is responding to treatment or not. And uh, usually we use an exophthalmometer, but in most cases you may not have an exophthalmometer, so you can also use a ruler. And usually you measure from the lateral orbital rim to the apex of the cornea. determine the amount of the difference in the two, and that would be the amount of proptosis, proptosis. Then you also check for ocular motility. You also palpate around the orbital rim to see whether there is any palpable mass. If there is a palp palpable mass, this will tell you in case you're going to do a biopsy, where it would be best to do to approach the biopsy. You should also do a vascular lesion, then usually there'll be an associated brewing. You also evaluate the visual acuity and also you check the pupillary light reaction. And what you're looking for here is a relative afferent pupillary defect because the presence of a relative afferent pupillary defect will indicate that there is optic nerve compression. And the investigations, of course, will depend on what you're suspecting the lesion to be. But basically, you need to do the full hemogram and the differentials. An orbital ultrasound may also be of value. X-ray of the orbit may also be of value. But the most important diagnostic imaging test is a CT scan. A CT scan is good because it's able to delineate lesions which are in bony cavities. And we know that the orbit is a bony cavity. An MRI is also, can also be useful. And especially if you're dealing with proptosis in a young child, a baby probably below two years, MRI would be optimal because CT scan exposes the patient to a lot of radiation and you want to avoid radiation in children. And then ultimately what to give you the definitive diagnosis will be a biopsy in case there is an orbital tumor. 
So when we look at the orbital tumors, it is always important to uh, differentiate between orbital tumors in children and orbital tumors in adults, because the orbital tumors in adults will be pretty different from the orbital tumors in children. And so we'll begin by looking at the orbital tumors in children. They can either be benign or malignant. They can also be congenital or acquired. Most of them will be acquired and they will be benign. Uh, most of them will be acquired and they may also be malignant, the acquired ones. So if we look at the benign ones, the commonest one will be capillary hemangioma. Uh, dermoid cyst is also a common orbital tumor, lymphagioma, neurofibroma, and optic nerve glioma. Um, the first two, capillary hemangioma and dermoid cyst, those are congenital, lymphagioma, neurofibroma, and optic nerve glioma are acquired, but they will tend to occur early in life. The malignant tumors in the ma malignant of the tumors in children, the most important one and the common commonest one is rhabdomyosarcoma. Then we also have a lymphoma, and in our setup in the tropics, the most important one is Bucket's lymphoma, which can either arise primarily in the orbit, or it can also uh, be a metastatic lesion from another site. Leukemia can also present as an orbital tumor in children and especially the acute myeloid leukemia and also neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma usually will be a metastasis to the orbit. It won't have a reason primarily in the orbit. In, in case you have any questions, please note them down and you can raise them at the end of the lecture. So this is a capillary hemangioma. Usually uh, uh, capillary hemangiomas will present at birth. They will usually appear reddish purplish. They will usually be quite large. And when you palpate it, it will be a soft lesion. It will be non-tender. And these are tumors that usually tend to regress as the baby grows. And by the age of two years, most of these tumors may have even regressed completely and will just leave a flat scar. Usually we, we, we will wait and see what happens to the tumor, whether it will regress spontaneously. But in case the tumor is causing an occlusion of the pupil in the baby's eye, then we cannot wait. And the reason why you don't want to wait when there is anything occluding a baby's eye is because if you cover the eye of a baby, then the brain will fail to mature sufficiently to enable that eye to see. And so the vision will be lost in that eye. And even when you correct whatever underlying problem was causing that eye not to see, the eye will not be able to see. And we call this amblyopia. So to avoid amblyopia, you must do everything possible to make sure that both eyes in a baby can see well. So for example, in this baby, if you check, you can see that the tumor in the left upper lid is causing a severe tosis that is basically covering that eye, meaning that that baby is not able to see well through that eye. And for this reason, we would have to intervene. And usually uh, we can treat by injecting uh, propranolol in the, in the lesion. Sometimes it can even be applied topically. And if this fails to work, then it may need to be surgically excised. So this is just a CT scan of a capillary hemangioma. And what you note is that it will tend to take up contrast quite habitually. So if you, if you, if, if, if you look at uh, on, on, the, uh, on the left, on the right side, you see that uh, tumor in the lid that is really lighting up with contrast. 
then dermoid cyst. These usually tend to be small palpable lesions in the anterior orbit. They are usually mobile, non-tender, and often they will not increase in size. Usually they'll be present at birth. They may increase slightly as the baby grows, but not much. And they are usually harmless unless the dermoid cyst ruptures. And the main indication of surgery is cosmesis. And so usually we will wait until the baby is a little older before we do surgical excision. And usually on histology, if you or even just uh, on uh, inspection, if you cut open the dermoid cyst, usually you find uh, uh, tissues that are connected to skin. You'll find, you may find a sebum, you may find hair follicle, you may find a um, hair, you may find, sometimes you may even find a ostium. So it can, it can be quite a mix of things. But as I've said, it is, it's usually harmless. And unless it is a, a causing tosis and occluding the visual axis, usually we will wait until the baby is a little bit older before we go on to exercise. Neurofibromatosis, uh, usually this will present uh, as the child grows, as the, as the baby grows. And on palpation, what you will find is that it will feel like a boggy lesion. And usually it will cause an S-shaped deformity of the lid. If you palpate the medial wall of the orbit, you may find a defect, especially in the zygomatic bone. Usually this is quite difficult to manage because it tends to recur. And excision is also almost impossible because of, it is, it, because of its diffuse nature. If you inspect the body of the patient, you may be able to find coffee ole spots or dark spots or hyperpigmented lesions on the patient's skin. And usually when we are dealing with neurofibromatosis, it's always a tricky condition to manage, can cause severe uh, disfigurement. Usually it is, it, it, it will not undergo malignant transformation and mainly the problem will be the disfigurement. And also, of course, if it is so big, it may also occlude the vision. Optic nerve glioma. This is a tumor of the optic nerve. Usually tends to appear in um, towards the age of 10 years and above. And usually will cause an exoproptosis. When we say exoproptosis, it means that the proptosis is directly anterior. It is not displaced to the left, to the right, inferior or superior. It is just a central proptosis. And this tends to be slowly progressive. The thing about optic nerve glioma is that it can uh, cause severe loss of vision because of the involvement of optic nerve. In a few cases, it may be associated with neurofibromatosis. And usually, we, usually it's managed by observation unless it causes severe proptosis with associated loss of vision, in which case removing it will not compromise. There'll be nothing to lose in terms of vision. But the problem with optic nerve glioma is if there is any vision remaining in that eye and you remove it, you remove the optic nerve glioma, then it means that you destroy any vision in that eye. And so usually we'll manage by observation up to the point where it may cause severe proptosis associated with total loss of vision. So this is a, a, a CT scan of a optic nerve glioma. And as you can see, it also tends to enhance quite well with, a, with contrast. Uh, then now we go to the malignant tumors. As I said, the most common one is orbital rhabdomyosarcoma. 
Usually these will present as a rapidly progressive proptosis. Occasionally when you're taking the history, the mother may say, oh, the baby fell or was hit or something like that. But usually these, we call them red herrings because they have nothing to do with the underlying condition. But often a mother will try to think of what could be causing this. And so they may give you a history that may throw you a bit off the track and give you a history of trauma, but usually it will arise um, spontaneously with no preceding trauma. It will be quite progressive. The thing to note is that unlike uh, in orbital cellulitis, where the proctosis is also rapidly progressive, there will be no pain. There'll be no pain and there'll be no fever. So this is one way to differentiate it from orbital cellulitis, but the progression will be quite rapid. The peak age is usually six to nine years and the, the, the lesion can arise, it can arise anywhere in the orbit, usually, um, will arise as a primary tumor in the orbit. It may be associated with loss of vision if there is optic nerve compression, but normally the vision in that eye will still be fairly good. When you palpate, you may be able to feel a firm lesion uh, that is not reducible. If you try to push it back, it will not go back into the orbit. As you can see in this picture, the, which way is the eye displaced? Lillian? Lillian Nakumi, which eye is the way, please? Which, which direction is the eye displaced? Lillian, are you there? Or you logged in and went back under the blankets? Joy, which way is the eye displaced? Inferior. Yes? Inferiorly. Inferiorly and which, which, in, in, only inferiorly? In lateral. Yes, very good. So you can see the globe is displaced inferolaterally, which means that the lesion must be superonasal. And when you do the CT scan, actually you can see the lesion is mainly uh, nasal. The diagnosis usually will be uh, through imaging and then followed by biopsy. Usually this is a tumor that responds very well to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And when you have rhabdomyosarcoma arising in the orbit, it has a very good prognosis. But of course it depends uh, at, at which point the patient presents. If they present late, then the prognosis may not be so good. Uh, a Bucket's lymphoma also may present as a tumor in the orbit, also tends to be rapidly progressive, painless, but it may be associated with the constitutional signs of lymphoma, including low grade fever. And uh, the, the diagnosis usually will be through biopsy, but also a bone marrow aspirate or bone marrow biopsy may help to guide the diagnosis. And the management, of course, will be through chemotherapy. Uh, this is a baby with metastatic neuroblastoma. Usually metastatic neuroblastoma will be rapidly progressive it will have usually it will arise from the uh, adrenal glands and it will present with bilateral proptosis. The child usually will be quite sick looking. And if you examine properly, you may find that they have temporal fullness. Like if you look at this baby, you can see there is temporal fullness. And also they may have other lesions on the scalp or, or, or on the forehead and these lesions will keep appearing and they look like uh, little balls. And so usually they'll be referred to as ping pong appearance, like the ping, ping, the tibotennis uh, ball or ping pong. 
And by the time a baby is presenting uh, with a orbital metastasis, then usually the prognosis is very poor. Then I also mentioned that leukemia can cause a, a tumor in the orbit. It can cause metastatic deposits in the orbit. And this is especially the acute myeloid leukemia. Usually we will present with a rapidly progressive proptosis. And the reason why it is referred to as a chloroma is because on the cut surface, that tumor tends to appear greenish or to have a greenish discoloration and therefore it's referred to as a chloroma. And usually as you treat the child for the acute myeloid leukemia, it will also tend to resolve. Then uh, the other thing that can cause a, a, a tumor in the orbit of a child is a advanced retinoblastoma. We'll see this later. And retinoblastoma is primarily a cancer in the eye inside the globe but if it is not managed early, then it can grow and go outside the globe and start extending into the orbit. And once it extends into the orbit, then it will cause a rapidly progressive proptosis. So now we will look at orbital tumors in adults. So in adults, just like in children, the tumors can be benign or malignant. The benign ones usually are lacrimogland adenoma, meningioma, cavinous hemangioma, and mucosils. The malignant ones are lacrimogland adenocarcinoma, lymphoma. You can also have invasion from adjacent structures and also metastasis from other areas in the body. The commonest sites for the, for, for where the tumor will have come from before it metastasized to the orbit to be different in males and in females. In males, it will usually be a, a, a cancer of the lungs. And in females, it will mainly be cancer of the breast. But cancers anywhere else in the body can also metastasize to the orbit. So we will look at a few of these individually. So did I talk of um, the other tumor that can occur in ab orbits is cavinous, yeah, I mentioned cavinous hemangioma. So cavinous hemangioma usually will arise in early adults, usually in the 20s. It will present as a slowly progressive proptosis. And this is a proptosis that will be variable when the patient coughs or sneezes or strains, then the proptosis will increase. Or when they bend down, the proptosis will increase. And when they sit up, then the proptosis reduces. Usually, the when you pul when 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 you palpate, there'll be no palpable mass anteriorly. But if you push the globe back, or when you do retropulsion, the globe will tend to go back in place. But as soon as you release the pressure, then the globe uh, springs back into the proctose position. And it, on, on CT scan, it will light up on contrast. It will, it, it, it will be very bright on contrast. And the management usually is excision. The problem is that it, it often causes optic nerve compression. So if it's, if it's not managed early, it can cause loss of vision. Uh, edmoidal mucosil usually will arise, you know, the edmoids are uh, adjacent to the orbit, the uh, edmoidal sinuses, they are adjacent to the orbit. They, they, nip, they are the lateral, they are the medial relations of the orbit. And if you have a mucosil there, it can cause a proptosis. And these are patients who will, will, who will present with, um, if you take a good history, there may be history of previous episodes of uh, sinusitis. And usually there may be minimal pain and the 
proptosis will be slowly progressing and these are patients will be managed by the ENT surgeons. Lacrimal gland tumors, as we know, the lacrimal gland is located in the lacrimal gland fossa, which is in the supratemporal aspect of the orbit. And therefore, lacrimal gland tumors will present with an inferonasal displacement of the globe. Usually, it will be slowly progressive. It will be painless. Usually, it will occur in the 40s. It, 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 the, 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 the tumors arise in the 40s, but also in some few cases, it can occur earlier, like in the 30s. It will be painless. And as I've said, it will be slowly progressive. And if you palpate, you'll be able to feel the tumor super temporary. And it usually tend to be firm in consistency and it will not be tender. And on CT scan, you can see it there. So it is usually well defined and encapsulated. And the management is by total excision. Usually you do not want to do um, incisional biopsy in a lacrimal gland adenoma because this can lead to malignant transformation. Uh, optic nerve sheath meningioma usually will also present with a slowly progressive proptosis that is painless. And usually when you palpate, you will not feel any mass and you'll only be able to see it on CT scan. And usually the management is by excision. So that is an, a CT scan of the optic nerve sheath meningioma. So you can see the lesion is really quite large. But also it is not just the optic sheath that can, where meningiomas can arise from, even the sphenoid wing, you can get a meningioma arising from there and causing a proptosis and management is by excision. Orbital metastasis, this is an example of a lady with orbital metastasis and the patient can present either with bilateral proptosis or unilateral proptosis. In a few cases, especially uh, um, when you're dealing with the uh, carcinoma of the breast, instead of proptosis, you can actually get an ophthalmos because there is the carcinoma of the breast that causes retraction. It causes uh, serious changes and uh, causes the tumors, the tissues in the orbit to shrink and therefore can also present with an ophthalmos. And usually when we see uh, a patient with, and especially an adult with bilateral proptosis, look for a tumor elsewhere in the body. This will most likely be due to metastasis from another site. And also meaning that you need to manage the tumor according to where it's arising from. By the time you're seeing a tumor metastasizing to the orbit, the prognosis is poor. So the investigations, whether it is a, a child or an adult who presents with proptosis, the investigations will usually be similar. It's very important to carry out a full hemogram Full hemogram will guide you to what could be the underlying problem. And also these are patients who you will most often need to be managed surgically or with chemotherapy. And so a full hemogram will be useful whichever way you look at it. Urea and electrolytes are also important, especially because, especially in the cases where you're going to have surgical intervention and also uh, chemotherapy. Orbital ultrasound, we don't use it uh, often because it is not available in most centers, but this is a non-invasive test that can guide you to where the lesion is and also can even guide you to the consistency of the lesion. But ultimately, the most useful imaging test uh, or imaging investigation, as I've mentioned, is CT scan. And when you order the CT scan and you're suspect because of uh, orbital tumor or because of proptosis, 
always remember to indicate that it is a CT scan of the orbit. Because if you just say a CT scan of the head, then you will get images that are focusing on the brain and not the site where you need to see. And also the slices have to be thin. Ultimately, biopsy will give you the definitive diagnosis and it can either be an incisional biopsy or an excisional biopsy, depending on what you're suspecting. By and large, as much as possible, if it is possible to excise the lesion in total, that is the best way to go. But there are some tumors that you may not be able to do an excision and an incisional biopsy will give you the uh, definitive diagnosis. Then other investigations will depend on what diagnosis you get on biopsy. Management depends on the nature of the tumor. However, there are two things to remember. Number one is that when the eye is proctosed, then the cornea is exposed. The leads may not be able to cover the cornea adequately, and it tends to get dry and may even melt, and the patient loses the eye. And it is uh, like, I just want to see, there is one eye. So like if you look at this picture, you can see the right eye, the cornea is completely exposed and it has, it, uh, if you look on the inferior aspect, it has dried quite significantly. And this is something you want to avoid because once the cornea dries and scars, even if you manage the underlying problem, you will not be able to restore vision. So it's very important to protect the cornea. You can protect the cornea by applying uh, the tracycline ointment. And also you can use a clean film to cover the cornea. You don't want to cover it with gauze because then it will stick on the cornea. And when you remove the gauze and it will do a lot more damage than even the dryness. The other thing, if you, as much as possible, we must prevent optic nerve compression. And therefore we must intervene early because once the optic nerve is compressed, then the vision will be lost and it may be irreversibly lost. So uh, just in, it, this is just the last slide in summary. If you forget everything else, please remember what are the causes of a rapidly progressive proptosis in a child, because these are things that will be life-threatening. And these include orbitocellulitis, Obitocidotuma, rhabdomyosarcoma, Parkinson's lymphoma, retinoblastoma, and leukemia. So if you see a rapidly progressive proptosis in a child, these are the things to think about. Okay, so that is the end of my first part of the lecture. So we will now go to the second uh, part, and that is retinoblastoma. Bless you. My mouth gone. My mouth seems to have disappeared. Can anybody see it? No. Mm. <laughs> okay, it is so. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is. Oh. 
Cool. Okay. So, uh, when we look at intraocular tumors, the main one that we are concerned about is retinoblastoma. This is the commonest, or um, it is like the most frequent intraocular tumor in our setup. In the West, uh, it will be melanoma of the uvea or uvio melanoma, but that is very rare in our setup. Maybe in my practice as an with uvio melanoma. And so it is so rare, we don't even focus on it. So our commonest intraocular tumor is retinoblastoma. <clears throat> So retinoblastoma is a primitive embryonic tumor from undifferentiated retin retinal elements. Um, do you know of any other, you, 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 you've, you've done pathology, yeah? No, we are doing that. Okay, so which, do you know of any other embryonic tumors other than retinoblastoma? Uh, so far, we have done CVS and GIT, so we know the okay. tumors in those systems. Okay, so which you have done the GIT and uh, CVS. CVS. So, uh, cerebral cardiovascular. Oh, yes. cardiovascular. Okay, okay. Then probably then you haven't covered others, but as you as 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 you cover as you go deeper into pathology, you come across other embryonic tumors like labromyosarcoma uh, is an embryonic tumor, uh, medulloblastoma, glioblastoma. So in the uh, Williams tumor or nephroblastoma, all those. Usually if you hear blastoma, it implies that it is an embryonic tumor. And uh, usually embryonic tumors will occur in childhood. So it's a commonest primary intraocular malignancy in children. It is a rare tumor with a frequency of about one in 14,000 to one in 20,000 life births. In Kenya, we did a study in 2009, which showed that it was about one in 17,000 life births. So it's a rare tumor. It does not have any ratio predilection, it, the, the, the incidence is the same worldwide, but because it is a tumor of young children, it means that places that have high birth rates, they will also have many more cases of retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma can either be unilateral or bilateral, and it will be bilateral in 30 to 40% of cases, meaning that in the remaining 30 to seven, uh, uh, 60 to 70%, it will be unilateral. Usually retinoblastoma will arise sporadically. When we say sporadic, it means that, that there have been no previous history of any family member to have that disease. But in 6% of cases, it can be familial. And retinoblastoma was one of the earliest tumors to be found that it has a genetic predisposition. Retinoblastoma, even though it is rare, it's a very important tumor because it is one of the cancers that is almost 100% curable if diagnosed and treated early. It is also a very easy to diagnose. It is also very easy to diagnose, and therefore, really, no child should die from retinoblastoma. And we will see why as we move on. So, briefly, I just want to mention about the genetics of retinoblastoma, because, as I've said, it it was one of the cancers to be. It it it, it was the earliest cancer to where a genetic 
component was recognized. And it is due to um, usually it will it, 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 it will be due to a mutation of the retinoblastoma gene, which is an autosomal dominant gene on the short arm of chromosome 13. And that is on the at the Q1 to 4 segment. However, even though it is autosomal dominant, it has a recessive behavior, which means that you have to get a mutation in both alleles for the cancer to arise. However, once you have a mutation in one of the alleles, then the other alleles becomes very unstable and it is very likely that it will also undergo mutation. And there are two uh, main uh, types of retinoblastoma. There is the germline mutation one, when we talk about germline mutation, it means that this is a mutation that occurs very early in embryogenesis. And therefore the mutation will be found in all the body cells, including the gametes. And therefore it is it will be transmissible to the offspring. Then there is also the somatic mutation. The somatic mutation usually will only arise in the retinal cells, and therefore it will not be transmissible to the offspring. And because of the recessive behavior of this gene, it has an incomplete penetrance. What this means is that somebody can have the genetic, the germline mutation, and the tumor does not even manifest, but they can still transmit that mutation to their offspring and they will manifest with retinoblastoma. That is what the incomplete penetrance means. I hope that is uh, the, 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 the most important thing I want you to understand from this is that retinoblastoma has a genetic underlying, there, there, there is an underlying genetic mutation and it can either be germline or somatic. And therefore, there is a risk that it can be transmitted to the offspring. So this is just a picture of a family that we, we were treating that had a familial retinoblastoma. And this is a family that had uh, four children. Uh, and it's only one of the children that didn't have retinoblastoma. But both parents were normal. But they had three children with retinoblastoma which means that one of the parents must have had the genetic mutation, but did not manifest. So the mean age at diagnosis, as we have said, um, embryonal tumors are usually tumors of childhood. In retinoblastoma, it occurs quite early in life. The unilateral retinoblastoma usually will occur later than the bilateral, because you remember, when, when we, we, we say that it can either be due to a germline mutation or a somatic mutation. Unilateral retinoblastoma will mainly be due to a somatic mutation and therefore will occur later in life. And the mean age of diagnosis worldwide is about 24 months. But in Kenya, our patients present much later and we find that the mean age of diagnosis is about 35 months or almost uh, three years of age. It is not because it occurs later in our setup, it's just simply that the patients present late. Bilateral cases, usually the mean age of diagnosis will be much earlier at about 12, 12 months. In Kenya, it is 26 months and simply because they come late. And the reason why bilateral occurs earlier is because this is due to germline mutation, which will occur very early in embryogenesis. And most of the times the baby already will be born with the tumor. In 90% of cases, the diagnosis will be made under the age of three years, that is in the West. In our 
in our, in, in our setup, you find even children coming at the age of five years with a problem that started at the age of three years. It is rare in older children and adults, but we have seen if, uh, like, um, currently we have one adult we are treating for retinoblastoma, but that was the first adult I ever saw with retinoblastoma. So it's very rare in children who are over the age of five years. The signs and symptoms. So the commonest way in which retino, retinoblastoma presents is with leukocoria. When you see chorea, it means pupil. Leuco means white. So simply a white pupil. And often the mother will come and uh, the, usually they may say that they have noted that there is something white in the eye of their child. Usually it may not be very obvious during the day and it is in the evening when they put on the light or when they light the lamp, then the pupil, because it's a bit dim, the pupil will tend to be a bit more dilated and the tumor will reflect the light from the, the we will reflect the light from the light source and therefore it will appear like a glow in the eye. And so sometimes it's even called a cat eye because it looks like the eye of a cat when you shine a light at night in the eye of a cat, the way it glows. But as the tumor becomes bigger, then the, 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 the white reflex may be more obvious even at daytime. And for this reason, if a mother comes and says there is something in the eye of her baby or of her child, even if you see nothing, this child must be referred as soon as possible to an ophthalmologist, even if you find nothing. Uh, a strabismus or squint is also one of the presentations of retinoblastoma, which means instead of the two eyes looking straight, one eye will deviate. Strabismus or squint simply means that the two eyes are not aligned. And so you see that one eye is deviating either outwards, what we call exotropia, or inwards, what we call, what we call isotropia. The patient can, might also present with a red eye. And if the patient does not present early, then eventually the eye will start popping out and they may present with proptosis. So in our setup, these are the common presentations. There are other presentations that may not be as common. This includes orbital cellulitis. So a child will present with all the hallmarks of orbital cellulitis, but there'll be no underlying infection. Usually orbital cellulitis will arise because retinoblastoma tends to undergo quite a bit of necrosis and this can uh, elicit an inflammatory reaction. They can also present with secondary glaucoma. Glaucoma in children usually presents with a big eye and tearing. And so when you see a child with an eye that is bigger than normal, glaucoma should be top on your list. And retinoblastoma can um, present with glaucoma because it can block the outflow of aqueous and cause the pressure to rise in the eye and the eye now becomes big. It can also present with spontaneous hyphema. Hyphema is blood in the anterior chamber. Usually hyphema will be as a result of trauma. But if a child presents with hyphema with no trauma, then we should suspect retinoblastoma. Nystagmus usually will occur in cases where you have bilateral retinoblastoma and with poor vision in both eyes. When children, when babies have poor vision in both eyes, usually it will manifest with nystagmus, which are rapid oscillatory movements of the involuntary movements of the globe. And uh, in bilateral cases, they may also present with poor vision. When it is unilateral, it's very difficult to detect that the baby has poor vision because the other eye will be seen. And so these are very important things to note and especially leukocoria because that is 
one of the commonest presentations over 80% of cases of retinoblastoma, leukocoria will be the initial sign. So this is what uh, is leukocoria. So if you look at this baby, the, the, the right eye, the pupil is black, the left eye, the pupil is white. And on top of that, you can see that the pupil is also dilated. So a white pupil is what is known as leukocoria. High femur, as we say, this blood in the anterior chamber. So retinoblastoma can also present with high femur, but if you check, you'll also see the leukocoria. Uh, then it can also present with secondary glaucoma where the eyeball is big. In this case, the eyeball is very big and you can see what you see there is actually the lens in the anterior chamber. The lens has been pushed into the anterior chamber there. That is the lens in the anterior chamber. But behind it, you can see the tumor that is pushing the lens forward. If you look carefully, you can see at the limbus, the sclera has become very thin and appears bluish. And that is normally what will happen when you have glaucoma in a child. And then we say if, it, if, uh, if, if you delay, then the child may present with proptosis. You remember this child from the orbital tumor, from the orbital tumors. So retinoblastoma is not the only thing that can cause a white pupil in the eye of a child. It's not the only thing that can cause leukocoria, but it is the most important one. But other things that can cause leukocoria in children include the congenital cataract, retinopathy of prematurity. So this usually will appear, uh, this, this will be in babies who are born prematurely because the retina is not fully developed. And usually premature babies, they'll also be having lungs that are not fully developed. They'll be put on oxygen. And this causes abnormal of vasculature to develop in the retina, which if not managed early, can eventually cause retinal detachment and scarring and can appear as a white reflex. Persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous is a congenital ab um, abnormality that can also cause a white reflex in the eye of a child. Organizing vitreous hemorrhage, when the, when the red cells have been uh, absorbed and what is remaining is just a fibrinous clot that can appear as a white reflex. Toxocariasis, this is a, this is a zoonotic disease where you have a, 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 the larva of Toxocara canis or Toxocara catis migrating into the tissues of the eye, especially the choroid, causing a granulomatous lesion that may appear as a white reflex. Coats disease is an acquired telangiectatic disease which causes the capillaries of the, uh, the retina to become abnormal and start leaking. And the exudate that leaks from those capillaries may appear as a white reflex. And ophthalmitis uh, may also appear as a white reflex, but this of course will be associated with all the other inflammatory symptoms and pain. So, but it's one of the other things that can cause a white reflex. Coloboma of the optic nerve or choroid can also cause a white reflex. There are many others like uh, Norris disease, which is mainly a, a, a congenital disease, uh, usually affecting boys that can cause a white reflex. So these are the other things that can cause a white reflex, but the most important to remember is retinoblastoma. The investigations include ocular ultrasound. This is a very useful investigation because it is able to, the way retinoblastoma is, is that the tumor tends to undergo calcification and an ocular ultrasound can pick up this, and this will give a very high suspicion of retinoblastoma. However, one thing to remember is that 
retinoblastoma is one of the cancers that you do not need any investigation to make a diagnosis. With a keen eye, one can, <coughs> excuse me, one can be able to, <coughs> excuse me, to make that diagnosis and actually even go on to remove the eye without doing any other investigation. So most of the investigations we do, they are supportive. They are not necessarily to make the diagnosis, but usually is to determine whether the, the, the cancer has spread beyond the globe. So the other investigations are CT scan. We want to avoid CT scan, especially in children with retinoblastoma, because children, especially those with a germline mutation, are predisposed to other malignancies later on in life. And when they are exposed to radiation, then this increases the risk of those malignancies. So we really want to avoid CT scan in these children and the preferable imaging test is MRI. These two investigations are mainly to check whether the tumor has gone outside the globe into the optic nerve or into the brain. So these are mainly to look out for metastasis. In a few cases, maybe about 1% um, of cases of retinoblastoma, they may have an associated tumor in the pineal gland, which is known as penialoblastoma. And in such patients, we refer to them as having trilateral retinoblastoma because the pineal gland tumor will arise primarily from the pineal gland, not from, not as a metastasis from the retinoblastoma. And so that is the other thing that we look out for when we are doing the, a scan of the brain in these children. Uh, CSF cytology, if you're suspecting that the tumor has gone outside the eye, so if you're suspecting metastasis, then this is when you will do the metastatic workup, which will include the uh, cerebrospinal fluid cytology to check for malignant cells and also bone marrow aspirate. Histology is very important when it comes to management of retinoblastoma because it is what will guide you whether the tumor has gone outside the globe or is still contained within the globe. It will also tell you whether there is a risk of, mal of a metastasis or not, because your further management will depend on what the histology shows. The histology of retinoblastoma usually will show small blue cells, small blue round cells. So it is a round blue cell tumor. It will, it will also show quite a bit of necrosis because retinoblastoma grows rapidly. It tends to outstrip its blood supply and therefore, you get areas of necrosis. You'll also get areas of calcification. And the hallmark of retinoblastoma is the flexner wintersteiner rosette. And also, um, when you have a good level of differentiation, you may have what we call fluorets. So this is an ultrasound of uh, an eye with retinoblastoma. So you can see the hyperechoic you can see the hyperechoic mass there. And where it is highly reflective, this is actually areas where there is calcification. And beyond that, you can see that shadow because the sound waves are being reflected back by the calcium. So this, this is what you will see in an eye with retinoblastoma on uh, ultrasound of this scan. This is a CT scan of a child with bilateral retinoblastoma. And so you, 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 you can see these hyperdense areas that are almost similar in the, having a similar consistency to bone. This is where it is calcified. And in the other eye, you can also see quite a large tumor there. And this in this in this CT scan, you can see this is a tumor that has already gone into the optic nerve. You can see the way the optic nerve is thickened there. And you can see there the calcification. 
and this is an uh, um, MRI T1 weighted of a child with retinoblastoma, and you can see the hypertense lesion there, which is the retinoblastoma. In T when it's T1 weighted, the vitreous tends to appear hypo intense, and the fat is hyper intense. So that is the orbit of fat, and that is the tumor there. And in the, this is T2 weighted. So in T2 weighted, as I said, now T2 weighted, here the vitreous appears hyper intense. And the tumor now appears hypo intense there. And this is just another tumor, um, another MRI. In this case, you can see that the tumor has extended to the orbit. Uh, who wants to tell us, is this T1 or T2? Emmanuel or Willie, is this a T1 or T2? From what we have just said. Emmanuel? I think it's a, I think it's a T1, T2. Yeah, it's a T2 because you can see the vitreous here is hyper intense, it lights up. But the, what I want you to note is the tumor that has gone into the orbit. So this is the tumor in the eye, but it has now gone out of the eye into the orbit, into the optic nerve. And usually when you see such cases, the prognosis is poor. So treatment of retinoblastoma, the mainstay of treatment of retinoblastoma is a nucleation. By the time a child is presenting with the white reflex, it means that the tumor is filling the, the it's, it's filling the globe. And that's why now you are able to see it reflecting the light. And by this point, usually the only useful treatment is a nucleation which means that you remove the globe, but you remove the globe and leave all the other tissues. You remove the globe, you leave behind the conjunctiva, you leave the, the extraocular muscles or the orbital tissues. But one of the things we always aim is to get a long length of the optic nerve because as much as possible, you want to have the resection margin of the optic nerve being free of the tumor. So that's why we want to get along uh, length of the optic nerve. Uh, in cases where the retinoblastoma is not so big, where the tumor is not so big, usually this will be in the fellow eye. Because when we see one eye with leukocoria, then we must always examine the other eye under anesthesia. And we, if you see small tumors in that eye, then if they are very small, we can do, we can treat them with laser, uh, either laser photocoagulation or thermotherapy. Normally we do thermotherapy. You can also freeze them by what we call cryotherapy. If they are a bit big, but still the eye has vision, then you can reduce them with chemotherapy and then do the other focal therapies like laser photocoagulation or cryotherapy. One can also use brachytherapy to try and save the eye. So brachytherapy means that you have a radioactive plaque that you, 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 you place over the tumor, leave it there for a few days to deliver focal radiotherapy to the tumor. External beam radiation, usually we will use this when you already have tumor that has extended into the orbit. Systemic chemotherapy and radiotherapy will also be indicated for tumors that have gone out of the eye or at a, are at a high risk of metastasis. And this is why we say histology is very important when it comes to retinoblastoma. 
then how does retinoblastoma spread? The commonest route will be through the optic nerve. We know that the eye is an external extension of the brain. It connects directly with the brain. And so if you have a tumor that is spreading through the optic nerve, then it will spread intracranially into the brain. It can also spread to the orbit. It can also spread hematogenously. And usually this will be to the scalp, to the skull, to the long bones and abdominal viscera. One thing to note is retinoblastoma rarely goes to the lungs. It's very, very rare to find retinoblastoma going to the lungs. And that is why we don't even bother with chest X-ray as part of the investigations in metastatic workup. It can also spread lymphatically to the leaf nodes. Which leaf nodes will it go to? You, you had a lecture on uh, anatomy of the eye? Yes, we did. So where, 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 where which, which, which leaf nodes does the orbit drain to? or even from your anatomy from first year. So usually it is the preauricular leaf nodes, then the cervical leaf, the, the, the mandibular leaf nodes and the cervical leaf nodes. So those are the areas where you palpate to check for uh, lymphatic spread of retinoblastoma. So prognosis, I started by saying that uh, retinoblastoma is one of the cancers that is almost 100% curable. Actually in the West, hardly anybody dies from retinoblastoma. Most of the patients will survive to adulthood, they will have families, but as I said, especially those with germline mutation, they have an increased risk of other malignancies, and usually they'll die from those other malignancies, not from retinoblastoma. And so long as the tumor is confined within the eyeball, the survival will be more than 95%. In our setup, uh, we had done a study in 2008, and at that point, our survival was 26%. And it was, it, it was very demoralizing, but we worked hard. And in our recent, we did a, uh, we, 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 we did a research 20, yeah, 2020, and we found our survival has improved to almost 70%. But the key is early diagnosis. Without early diagnosis, it doesn't matter where in the world the child is. If the, if the disease is not diagnosed early, and has spread by the time the child presents, then it will be very difficult to cure the child. And so when we look at the pathology, we always look at the features that are a high risk to metastasis, which include massive choroidal invasion, optic nerve invasion, and scleral invasion. So those are the main features that will lead to metastasis. And the risk factors for death are delayed management and extraocular extension. And then I have said, by, sorry, as I have said, uh, patients with germline mutations, so those with bilateral disease, they have an increased incidence of non-ocular malignancies late, in later years. And this is worsened or the risk is increased by exposure to radiation. So we always advise the mothers not to allow their children to have any X-ray or any CT scan unless it is absolutely necessary. So uh, just uh, as I wind up, that is just one of the posters that has helped in improving survival of our children. And this is a poster that we had put everywhere. And it is just to create awareness on retinoblastoma and what somebody should do when they see a white reflex in a child. But please remember also the other features that we say, things like squint, things like um, um, stagmas, 
if you see this in a child, please do not delay. Send that child to an eye, to an ophthalmologist. Don't send them through the normal route to the sub hospital, to the district hospital. Send them straight to where there is an ophthalmologist because if this is diagnosed early, then we can cure the cancer and save the life of the child. And that's the end of my presentation. Sorry, I've gone be a little beyond time, but I can take a few questions. Any questions? Any questions? So is it that you understood nothing or it was clear? Lillian, Umiamka. Lillian Nakumicha. You're still under the blanket. No, I've been there. Ah, oh, you're there? Yes, I've been there. Ah, okay, okay. So do you have any questions? No, no. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, sawa, sawa. Then uh, I wish you all a very good day. And Dr. Please... Chimani, yes? there's just one question in the chat yes. box. Uh -huh. uh, oh, sorry. Kindly go let over me... the ethoidal oh, mucosils. Me... Oh, yeah. Okay, let me see. Oh, uh, somebody is saying I go over ethmoidal mucosils. No, I will not do that because as I said, this is an ENT problem. So you will learn this when you come to ENT because even when we find patients with proptosis and we do a scan and find that it is because of a mucosid, we'll send them to the ENT. Okay, any other question? All right then, have a very good day. Recording stopped. Thank you, Dr. Kimani for the You're lecture welcome. today. You're welcome.